Okay, that's actually working. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to My Security TV, and this is a special episode with Australia's former ambassador to China, Mr. Jeff Raby, and it's a live book review uh, on his most re recent uh, book, China's Grand Strategy and Australia's Future in the New Global Order. Jeff, thank you very much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, for the audience, uh, the protocols are, we are live on GoToWebinar, uh, also YouTube and Facebook, and the session is being recorded and the recorded edited session will be available uh, also on our YouTube channel. And uh, I will accept some questions from the audience if you do have some, but only the GoToWebinar audience that have actually signed in. Now I mentioned uh, Jeff is Australia's uh, former ambassador to China 2007 to 2011, uh, the ambassador to APEC 2003 to 2005, and ambassador to the World Trade Organization 98 to 2001, and is proudly awarded the Order of Australia in 2019 for your services to Australia-China relations and to international trade. So Jeff, pleasure to meet you and thank you for our pre-interview discussion. Um, your book is published by Melbourne University Publishing and in the go-to webinar, but I'll put it into the notes as well, uh, the mup.com.au, uh, you can find Jeff's book there now available on paperback. Jeff, um, I was going to show you the book. There's various uh, dog ears, uh, tags, uh, pretty much every page has got an underline at some point. Um, it was a very good book to read and um, you've finished kind of writing it in June. So it's current to June. And this also follows uh, for our audience that do, do sort of follow us as well. We've just conducted a 10 part Indo-Pacific series. Uh, before that we had India's Reach series and we did a book review uh, on Rory Metcalf's book on, on the Indo-Pacific and why China won't rule the future. And also a book from the Center for Land Warfare Studies in New Delhi uh, on India's challenges on COVID-19 and, and their thoughts around this as well. So uh, this is in context uh, to our audience and, and to the work that we've been doing. And in our pre-interview, we were talking about the ABC Insiders show. There was uh, Kevin Rudd, Malcolm Turnbull on, some recent comments from Arthur Sinodinus, Australian ambassador to the US. Uh, there's been some issues in Hong Kong today. Uh, and in co including comments from uh, Foreign Minister Maurice Payne, uh, announcements from Prime Minister Morrison that he's off to Tokyo next week. Australia's uh, in the Malabar, the Quad, uh, naval exercises. Um, so there's so much going on in the context of this book. Uh, your timing's impeccable. Uh, you must have seen this coming as far back as June. <laughs> oh, thanks, Chris. I, I, I wish I did. Um, it was COVID-19 that made it possible. Fair enough, yes. And the book's COVID-19. It must be the first book ever dedicated to COVID-19. <laughs> well, and you know, the book's been in my head for the best part of a decade. And frankly, just my life's been busy and I've never really had the space. And when we got into lockdown in Sydney, I thought, well, this is it, now or never. And I basically wrote it over a 13 week period, but it was full of anxiety because as you say, every day I'd wake up and think what's next, what's happened. So much was happening, so much has still happened. Um, and I had, a, you know, it was a lot of anxiety. And, you know, when you do a book like this, you're writing about many, many movable parts. And possibly in the last eight months, it's, the parts have never been more in motion. Very much. And I think that's, again, um, I read it probably in two to three kind of sittings. So it was quite quick. Um, and as you mentioned, you kind of started off the, the premise of the book uh, starts uh, in sort of 2012. You gave a Richard Larkins oration at Monash University. Uh, it was about 12 months after you came back from China after four and a half year stint there as the Australian ambassador, and you served 27 years. And it was also 2011 that Barack Obama came to Australia and announced the Asian pivot, as you point out. And again, it was about the same time we started publishing the Asia Pacific Security Magazine. Uh, we did a, a interview actually with um, Francis Adamson, who must have been your predecessor uh, after you uh, as well. Big pardon. My successor. Your successor, big pardon, predecessor. Um, and 
she started to use the language in that interview of the Indo-Pacific, and that's when the language of the Indo-Pacific started to get introduced uh, also to foreign policy, and now it's steadfast uh, foreign policy. So you gave a presentation at the National Press Club the other day, but I sort of, I can imagine where some of this is heading, so I understand how you were thinking, but maybe let's start off with the title of the book, uh, China's Grand Strategy. Maybe just outline what you mean by the title, why that title came about and sort of what is that grand strategy? Uh, and then we'll move to the context of how that sits with Australia. Yes, no, I think it's a very good place to start. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, it's important to try and understand where, what China wants. And that's been a topic of conversation amongst academics, scholars and so on for quite a long time. Um, uh, it, it has a grand strategy. It hasn't published a grand strategy under that heading. So you have to uh, uh, divine it from uh, actions and, and, and statements. And uh, I think there's probably a reasonable amount of agreement that China's grand strategy basically uh, has two main objectives. Uh, one is to continue and ensure uh, China's territorial integrity. So keeping the place together is of enormous importance, absolutely uh, uh, almost uh, a neurologic importance it is this whole issue of um, territorial integrity. And if you understand that, you understand, you begin to understand a lot of things about China's behavior in its uh, uh, peripheral regions, uh, the, the, the way it's dealing with Hong Kong uh, Taiwan's slightly different, but it's all part of this whole issue of territorial integrity. And the other key element of China's grand strategy is maintaining uh, the rule of the Chinese Communist Party. And I argue, not so much in the book, I get, I, to be honest, Chris, I've done quite a few discussions, and I think this argument sort of developed subsequently. But if you think about it, the two things are, uh, are sort of mutually reinforcing. Um, if China were to cede any inch of territory uh the party would fall the the reaction of uh the chinese would be such against the government so any government in china has to be massively tough and strong on territorial integrity but equally um china may not have any unity if it didn't have the party running the show or at least that's what many people in china think and believe and the origins of both of these elements, I think, go back to the very founding of the People's Republic in 1949, when the Communist Party prevailed in the civil war against the nationalists. It did not inherit an existing state or an existing nation. It took over shards of territory. And from those shards of territory, it had to fashion a nation which it did and did fairly quickly in the early years of the 1950s, and then protect and hold that nation together. And that experience, I think, you know, dominates uh, party leadership, government leadership, strategic thinking, strategic priorities uh, to this day. So that essentially is China's grand strategy. It has many instruments of statecraft it uses to pursue the grand strategy. And I, I think probably now, the most important element in a, the instruments of statecraft it employs to pursue a strategy is the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, so that's where that part of the title comes from. And I think the other thing is we talked about the Communist Party there and, you know, we're seeing the rise of nationalism as well there also. Is that, you know, as China's emerged as, as a leader and when it, you know, sort of does become sort of equivalent to the United States uh, economically, as well as potentially military in the next sort of 10, 15 years, those internal risks will increase as well. And it may not sort of achieve that. It, it could implode. And you did mention that, that that is one possible outcome. Uh, I, I'm not sure I was, I was saying that. Um, what I was saying, uh, a big chunk of the book is about this, that China obviously is uh, already the dominant power in East Asia. Uh, its ascendancy has been powered and driven by its economy and that 
is most likely to continue, I can see another 20, 30 years of strong economic growth in China, unless there is some major external shock. And the pandemic might have been that shock, but instead China responded incredibly well dealt with the pandemic and is now recording the highest growth rates in the world again. Um, what I'm saying is that, well, militarily, I, it, it, China's not, I don't think, going to catch up with the US unless the US gave up. And US has such global interests, I don't see that happening. Um, but the question that has to be really addressed is that as China emerges or really uh, reinforces its position as the dominant power in the region, um, is it an existential threat to states in the region, including Australia? And my argument is really China's not. And the second part of the book, uh, after I've dealt with grand strategy and, and the new order, um, deals with the constraints on China's exercise of power. And I call um, China, I, I describe as a constrained superpower, and that section of the book is called Prometheus Bound, to perhaps make the point a little bit more eloquently, um, that whatever China's intention might be, you have to look at its capacity to realize that intention. I'm not sure you can divine that China's intention is any sort of um, global dominance. It wants respect in the world. It clearly wants to be um, a key participant in global forums in shaping uh, global norms and institutions and rules, um, not, a, not a taker, but a maker as the US has been uh, in the post Second World War period. Um, but I'm not sure that all that adds up to being an existential threat. And you, you talked about I if you treat know. China like a, an enemy it will become one, um, maybe in that terms of what we're seeing in the Indo-Pacific and, and also the rise of, or the more relevance of the quad uh, Malabar exercises uh, of note as well. But uh, the Prime Minister mentioned the quad today uh, as being uh, sort of quite one of the most more important platforms. And it was, uh, I hadn't really heard the used, it It was mentioned even before the G7 and G20. Um, your thoughts on the quad, you, you do cover the quad uh, in in the book and how it might be perceived by China if the Quad becomes a military rather than a diplomatic dialogue. Uh, it does seem to be moving over to that military side and then that brings in the relationships between India and uh, Japan and China. Yeah, well, look, on the Quad, I've been uh, critical of Australia's involvement in the Quad uh, you know, for a very long time. And you know, I do a monthly column in the AFR and I've criticised the Quad on many occasions. The Quad was a very peculiar beast. And I won't go through its, uh, its um, incremental history, but uh, it was weird because it was something, uh, uh, an organization whose name we feared to mention, a, a body whose name we dare not mention. And that's because it was at the beginning and it is today uh, primarily about containing China. Well, and that, I mean, that, that, that might be a fine, legitimate uh, objective, or not realizable, I don't think, but um, that's why everyone danced around what the Quad was for, what it was doing. And I really think I called the Quad out many years ago. Now, there, there's no ambiguity. Uh, it's now been completely militarized. It had three military corners, India, Japan, and the US with the Malabar exercises. We've been pleading uh, with India to let us in for years and India's finally agreed and why has it taken so long for India to let us in because they did not want to militarize the quad they did not want to do that in terms of their bilateral relations with China and I think we've been brought in as a um, as a uh, uh, instrument uh, for India to put pressure back on China over what happened in Ladakh uh, the, the border conflict back in June for India to show China that it had options uh, in terms of strengthening global or, in, or regional um, uh, uh, pushback on China. But let me just say quickly, Chris, please, why I, I've always been critical of the Quad from Australia's perspective. You know, if, if India, China um, 
and the US want to get together, so India, uh, the US and Japan want to get together, well, so be it. From our point of view, no one has ever been explained, explained why it makes sense or why it is in Australia's interest for us to join a body where the three other members are China's strategic competitors. Uh, the US, because it's the dominant power resisting the ascendant power, Japan's got territorial issues and so is India. If we're in the quad, are we saying that China is our strategic competitor? Is China our enemy? If it is, say it. But we've danced around, but now I think it's absolutely clear um, that we have um, closely aligned ourselves, not only with the Quad, pleaded to get into the Malabar, which is basically the military dimension of the uh, Quad. We've now achieved that. And, um, and, and, and uh, Secretary of State Pompeo, how I think has helped everyone a lot um, to understand what this is all about. He has actually called the Quad a vehicle for containing China and not only containing China, but pushing China back into its rightful place. And the question our policymakers have to ask, whilst it might be nice to be sitting at the table with the US, Japan and India, is that really in our interest to align ourselves so closely with China's strategic competitors? And the whole bit about the Quad just being a group of countries to chat about you know, shared values, it's arguable what values we share with, um, with uh, India in so many respects. Uh, after all, India was uh, much more closely um, uh, aligned with the Soviet Union during the Cold War than it was the United States. Um, but, uh, uh, you know, Abe, when he created the Quad, talked about a dialogue of democracies or a diamond of democracies. But then why aren't other democratic countries in the region part of it? Why isn't South Korea involved? Uh, the Philippines, Indonesia, these are real vibrant democracies in the region, but they've never been part of the Quad uh, because they would have nothing to do with containing China. That's the short answer. So it divides the region. It brings more conflict into the region. And uh, I mean, the, 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 the die is set. I mean, it's not gonna change. It's not gonna be unraveled. Uh, no one's gonna take any notice of my uh, views on this. Uh, it's got too much momentum but we do have to be absolutely conscious of what we're doing. And I really don't think policymakers are. And, and partly I think also we've been shoehorned into it by the United States. The other key aspect, you, you uh, make 10 points for a foundation for Australia's strategy, and we'll cover that next, but just in what you were talking about with the Quad and the uh, you know, South Korea and, and the others aren't included either, but how does that bring with ASEAN and where do you think ASEAN is, and we hear the ASEAN plus three, ASEAN plus plus six. Do you think we're doing enough with ASEAN and just focusing on what uh, our own immediate region with ASEAN? And you know, uh, and we have. To, are you saying we have to sort of take a step back from our alliance with the US? Uh, I, well, absolutely not our alliance with the US. I think we just have to. Uh, uh, be more focused on having an authentic independent foreign policy from the US. I mean, point number one of my 10 points is that uh, regional stability and security depends on the US continuing to be deeply engaged in East Asia. There's no question about that. Uh, uh, so it's not about the alliance. It's about in the context of the alliance, our capacity to run a foreign policy, which reflects our interests not only those of the United States. And we have to begin by acknowledging a couple of things. One, our interests aren't identical to the United States. You know, exports from the US to China are only about 20% of US's global exports, uh, unlike 40% for Australia. Um, and uh, 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 you know, we're, not a, we're not a dominant power. We're not, we're not threatened by China's rise. And, and China's not our strategic competitor. So we're, we're, our interests are quite different. They overlap in many places, but they are also different and distinct, and that needs to be acknowledged. And then we need to work out um, ways of dealing with our neighbors in the region, whereby all of us who share the same issues and all of us do with China, uh, find forums and engagement that helps to um, hedge against China, hedge against China's bad behavior. Um, now, 
so coming back to the quad for a minute, there has been earlier on this year, there was a, a meeting over pandemics or something using the quad as the, the, the nub and adding on Vietnam and uh, New Zealand, I don't know, maybe Singapore, so I forget. But let's have, let, 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 let's have a, uh, a, a, a quint or a set or an oct. Let's have, uh, let's have uh, bodies where there's like six, eight, ten countries involved. And, and, and which don't consist exclusively of, a, of China's strategic um, competitors. Um, but we need to build regional architecture um, and in various ways the hedge of China uh, shows China there will be costs to bad behavior. But hopefully on a more positive note, China can be a constructive participant in it. It sounds like recent, the Regional Economic Cooperation Group is close to conclusion after uh, snail's pace for the last 10 years and many disappointments. Uh, well, China is a key driver of that and ASEAN is closely involved as, as well and we are. And so that is a, a body and a forum, even though it may not do a lot, uh, it actually brings countries in the region together uh, and it includes China. And so Chris, my last point that is I, I advocate strongly at the end of the book that we ought to lead regional discussion on creating a um, regional security mechanism. We live in the most dangerous region in the world and it has no security mechanism. And that's a conversation that began uh, in the middle of the last decade with the six party talks. Uh, and there was a possibility they might have evolved into a regional security mechanism. It's time to get back to that sort of discussion um, and we, I think, would have a key role to play and we could be a very good interlocutor with China and Japan, uh, China and, uh, and the US. The problem is, of course, we have no official contact, basically, with China at present. We can't talk to them about anything. Well, I was going to say, what, what other bodies? You mentioned uh, the regional cooperation. The, what other key bodies would, would you kind of align? You, you said that we can start to have sort of dialogue and send sort of messages out to China that, you know, almost the olive branch approach. What would be some of those key bodies? Is, is ASEAN a potential body or we should just be uh, generating uh, a fresh uh, dialogue and a fresh body for that? Yeah, yeah no, Chris, good question. Look, I, I, I think ASEAN has to be the core. Now, people are very skeptical about that because ASEAN often has trouble getting consensus and doing things. But to the extent that this recent uh, is now about to be signed, then it demonstrates it might take time, but things can happen. Uh, there's all the ASEAN plus dialogue um, and uh, mechanisms and summits. They're all valuable. I think APEC is still valuable. Uh, I think it would be great to uh, engage APEC in a discussion about uh, managing pandemics in the region. And of course, that would involve China and the US all sitting around the same table. These are all things that engage China and the region, lock it in, um, and uh, uh, also involve the US, uh, and they don't divide the region. And I think in many ways, that's where our foreign policy has, has lost its way. It's, it's focused too much on a US agenda of pushing back and containing China and not enough on constructive, positive, forward-looking ideas on how to engage China and basically tie it down into regional arrangements. And, and, and here's a very good example, which no one talks about, the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank. That was a Chinese initiative. It's regarded as an extremely well-run, governed uh, body. But China did not have to create a new piece of multilateral architecture if it was just about um, finding a vent for China's surplus uh, uh, construction capacity and, and recycling its foreign exchange reserves. But it wanted to create real multilateral architecture. It's done that, but the US has not agreed to participate. Uh, it nearly stopped us joining. Our cabinet was split for six months back in 2014 over joining or not joining. Eventually we did join way down the pack and we lost all our early mover advantage but japan's not a member what would be more constructive in the region than to have japan a member of the asia infrastructure investment bank but they won't go in because the americans have pushed back so hard so you know 
I think there is much capacity in the region, a possibility to build coalitions, alliances. Some of them would be about hedging China, as I said, and showing China there would be costs for bad behavior, and I'm thinking particularly around the South China Sea issues, uh, and others uh, should be forward looking, forward leading, including, as I just mentioned, uh, working to try and develop some sort of regional security mechanism. One of the areas of definitely, you're definitely strong and you, you come from that uh, diplomatic background and also um, your time at the WTO um, was the economic risk to Australia. And you mentioned there the, sort of the cost to China or how, how, how can we show that there's a cost uh, in sort of China's bad behaviour? How would we execute that? And then I want to move on to the economic risk, risk to Australia uh, should China choose to to get really nasty? Yeah, well, in terms of economic cost, I, I really think uh, uh, none of this stuff's easy, right? It, it, and I, I, if it was easy, it would all, all would have been done. Um, but I do think um, uh, having groups of inf or having individual influential countries in the region uh, pushing back on China um, for, for bad behaviour, for example. Um, by um, uh, you know, its joint statements, its representations, uh, it may be restrictions on the activities of some Chinese companies. You, know, you, you, you could have a whole gradated, uh, graduated rather, uh, range of things you could do. The point is Beijing doesn't want and wouldn't like to see uh, countries in its immediate region uh, uh, forming coalitions to put pressure on it. Yep. Well, the other it's thing is you really that. make a, the point of China's soft power is they're just not very good at it. Um, yeah. And they haven't really, uh, if anything, they've lost a lot of friends over what they've been doing. And even um, almost the last uh, couple of pages, you point out all the things that China has kind of been doing here in Australia, foreign interference, cyber attacks, uh, you know, all sorts of uh, things that you wouldn't expect from a strategic um sort of partner or you're definitely from a competitor, not uh, someone you're strategically cooperating with. Um, the, the economic risk uh, for this and how if, there's, if their soft sort of power diplomacy is no good and they don't like being told uh, they're doing the wrong thing, how are we supposed to have that kind of strategic cooperation with them because the disparity in size between Australia and China, if we do kind of uh, align ourselves away from the US more to ASEAN, uh, may not hold much weight? Uh, well, no, I think because we're in the region, the immediate region, uh, it, it is actually very potent uh, against China. Um, but it's, it's not something you do all the time. But, but it's, it's there. I mean, there should be um, uh, ongoing government-to-government -government engagement in a coordinated way. So, for example, um, uh, the issue with the Uyghurs. Uh, very serious human rights abuse going on in Xinjiang, as far as we know from all the, the published Western sources. Uh, we have many Muslim countries in the region. Indonesia is the largest Islamic country in the region. Now, clearly it's not an issue because we're not an Islamic country. For us to lead on, although we have many Islamic citizens in Australia, but these are conversations we can have. And if China saw a um, group of Islamic, non-Islamic countries um, uh, coming together and making representations to them on these issues, that would actually be very powerful. Again, this this is not what China would expect from the region. So I think not easy to do. I mean, we know it's not easy to do, but we haven't even begun to build habits of cooperation around what I would regard as a hedging strategy. Uh, or imagine a regional conference that didn't include either either um, China or the US that had as its principal um, subject how to hedge China. But Beijing would just you know, find that such a slap in the face, not intended to be a slap in the face, but it would, it would really send a message that there are limits to what you can do. And where is our, where do you see our trade strength with China? And 
I suppose, again, you talk about the economic risk. Uh, how much uh, would Australia change should we continue down a strategic uh, com competition with, with China, allowing ourselves to the US? As we talked about pre-interview was, you know, during the next sort of 10 years, the US may well recover and do quite well. The rest of the region will continue on economically and the recovery will go on. We may not be so aligned. We, it's maybe a good thing economically that we uh, will find new markets and the impact might not be so bad. I know, look, I think uh, this discussion we're having at President Australia about diversifying away from China, again, you know, it's perennial. This is not the first time it's come up, even when relationships were in a great state. Um, uh, this, you know, people will talk about this. There's a very fundamental basic reason why, reason why we are so deeply integrated with China and so dependent on the Chinese market. And that's simply because of the fundamental comparative advantage that exists between us. Our economies fit together uh, in terms of comparative advantage extremely well. Just like our economy fitted together so well with Japan, with South Korea, uh, with Taiwan, so it is with China. What makes China different is its vast scale. So sure, you know, you can tell the, um, the, uh, the, 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 the lobster fisherman from Western Australia who I saw interviewed on television the other night um, to forget about his 20 years of building relationships in China and sell his crayfish somewhere else. And sure, he'll be able to sell them, but at what price? Yeah. Beijing's going to do us all a favor. We're all going to eat cheap lobster and uh, drink cheap premium wine in Australia. It's just simply the scale. And the other thing is in 15 years, some 300 million middle-class consumers have been added in China and they pay premium prices. So, you know, we will be, China takes 40% of our exports. It accounts for about 10% of our GDP. If, 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 if we um, feel we have to diversify or start looking for other markets and we're not able to sell what we have been selling to China, well, we will be a lot poorer for it, but also we're going to lose all the future growth. This is not a static issue. Xi Jinping has just come out and said that China will double its GDP by 2035. That's not hard. It's 15 years away. You only need to do three and a half, four percent. And they're doing that already today in, in, in sort of COVID constrained conditions. Um, we're going to miss all that growth as well. Governments in Australia have talked for as long as I can remember about India as, as the next China. Well, and we've had report after report, initiative after initiative, huge diversion of diplomatic resources into India. And our exports to India have hardly grown in 10 years. Noted. Uh, I'm also West Australian, so I was uh, in WA during the boom time, uh, sort of 10 or so years ago, uh, which was driven by China and the iron ore. So obviously that particular market is, is huge for Australia. I suppose the other area that you may not have covered very uh, sort of a lot is the technology side. And you talked about the rise of the middle class in China. From a technology standpoint, we are moving into a, a sort of a, a separated world between China technology and Western technology. And we have, we, they won't be talking or integrating with each other. And there's mistrust in that technology as well. Um, and then we've also got a space race on also, which might be a good thing. Uh, for Australia, and we're looking at the talk around sovereignty is also increasing, particularly around space communications uh, and those types of issues. So I suppose that one area I wanted to cover off on your thoughts on the technology side, and it's linked to economics because we, you know, that economic link, you talk about lobsters, iron ore, and those types of things are there, but then there's also a, sort of the digital economy that uh, is at both either at risk, but also we're we're moving away from something like that at the size of China with 1.3 billion people all, all all connected. So yeah, your thoughts on the space race and also the technology divide that, that's coming? Well, I don't know much about the space race at all. And you're right, the book is quite light on the technology story. It's just not my strength or area. Um, uh, but on the splinter net, the sort of 
potential of a sort of parallel universe of uh, internet. I think all that's very real. And I think we have to be very careful because the West sort of initiated all this discussion about decoupling and it preceded uh, COVID. COVID has just amplified things that were already happening. So decoupling was a big issue, uh, led very much by the United States. And it was really, I think, couched in punitive terms um, about China. Uh, but I think the Chinese have responded in a very different way than anticipated. Um, Xi Jinping now has this new policy of, um, of the twin circulation, which I understand really as being just another fancy name for import substitution. Um, and China, I think, is starting to come to a view, well, who cares? We don't need the, net. We don't need the West. Uh, we will develop these technologies ourselves. Um, they've got a massive market, of, and I know this for sure, that, that but planners and, 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 and policy people in, in Beijing um, begin for the premise, well, we have 1.4 billion people. Uh, you know, we don't need other markets. Now, that's not true, but that is the, the starting point. Um, and so uh, I think China is, and, and probably they would prefer a splinter net that goes um, across Eurasia, uh, and all the uh, authoritarian states in the world uh, embrace rather than the, the, the Western, more open, more liberal uh, internet. Um, we have, uh, you know, we, we, we pat ourselves on the back uh, because we comprehensively banned Huawei from the 5G. Uh, back in 20, um, gosh, I don't know, 2018, I think, or 17, uh, before any other country. But Huawei is the digital backbone of Eurasia, and China's the dominant power of Eurasia now. Uh, so that is, there is another world out there that I don't think we really quite factor in. The, 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 the world of geopolitical competition, in my view, is not really in the Western Pacific around um, the South China Sea. The really big game in geopolitical uh, competition is going to be played out increasingly in Eurasia. Yeah. And uh, that's one reason I have to say, just as an aside, I'm sorry if I'm going down a side alley, it's one reason why I think the Biden administration may actually become much more of an Atlanticist administration in foreign policy terms, rebuilding its alliances with Europe, strengthening NATO, and all about trying to develop a strategy to win Russia back from China. Because effectively, Russia has been lost to China by the sanctions and limits on it. And that has greatly strengthened China. And that's why I say, think about Eurasia, uh, which is dominated by China. Uh, China is the digital power, the technological power um, in, 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 in that part of the world. Um, so, I, I it's interesting see... language when you talk about, you know, East Asia and, and Eurasia. It's quite different to the way that the Indo-Pacific is displayed. It's almost a completely different model when you talk about the Indo-Pacific being, you know, the region where you talk in different language in, in different regions. So it's it, that that change in language is can be misleading, isn't it? Not misleading, Chris, I don't think. Uh, uh, hopefully, maybe not misleading. Hopefully, can create misunderstanding. Well, I'll come to the Pacific in a minute, but I, I hope what I'm saying is actually stimulating by bringing in some new thoughts. Because remember, uh, my vantage point and what gives my book uh, a unique perspective is it's written by a Western uh, diplomat, economist, foreign policy analyst uh, from a Beijing perspective because I've lived in Beijing for the last 13 years. And in fact, I spent five years there in our embassy as the chief economist from 86 to 91. And that's why if you sit in Beijing, you think about Eurasia. You know, the, 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 the Eurasian steps are just up the road, as it were. Um, and uh, you drink vodka, not jungle juice. I mean, it's, 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 it's a different world and a different perspective. And for all of China's settled history, its security has uh, been derived from the inland, from the land, from the land masses around China, uh, effectively Eurasia. China has only recently become a maritime power. Maritime power really putting 
the, the voyages of Admiral Zhang He to one side in the 15th century, China has only very recently started to look to the sea. And that's partly what I think is, is, is quite unsettling for the US, which has always been a dominant sea power. Um, but uh, yeah, sorry, I lost my thread on the, on the story, but I think this is an interesting uh, way of viewing the world. As I said, what my vantage point is, is how a strategic policy person in Beijing would think about the security uh, outlook from that perspective. I mean, other than trade, where how do you think Beijing views Australia? Is it uh, you know it, aside from our relationship with the US, how would they view Australia uh, if we didn't have that alliance? And you say the joint of the hip uh, foreign policy with the US. Do you think that they would be favourable to us and it's a, a purely trade relationship and we can cooperate? Because I've got my concerns around the, the strategic cooperation. It's fine for some areas of the economy, for, but for technology, I do see the risk there that uh, Western nations don't want to have that. Uh, and we, that's where that alignment with US technology comes to play. So I think, yeah, how, how, how does China or how should China view Australia putting aside the relationship with the US? Um, do you think we can be strategic uh, partners uh, on everything or only going to be on certain things? And is that enough? Oh, it will always, yeah, Chris, good point, very good point. It will always be selective. It has to be. Uh, and it doesn't have to be any, any different in my view. I mean, I, I've always thought the, 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 the formula that works with China in terms of our bilateral relationship is you know, we have massive areas of common interests, identify them and work on them, but recognize there are very significant differences. And let's work out how to manage those differences so we don't get in the way of our broader interests. And my argument would be that we have stopped doing that. Now, the world has changed, China has changed, I think probably the extent to which has changed is exaggerated. I mean, China's assertiveness in the South China Sea didn't begin two or three years ago. It was it was been assertive for for, for decades. It has come and gone. Uh, but when I first went to Beijing as ambassador in 2007, China was throwing its weight around in the South China Sea, and the threat to Taiwan was seen as the most dangerous um, uh, issue facing the world in terms of peace and security. Uh, and not, that not, a lot away. To, not a lot has changed really. Yeah. No, exactly. But you know, we, we, we then have uh, the global financial crisis. Everyone starts worrying about their, their economic growth and suddenly they forget about those issues. And uh, suddenly those issues come back again. But of course, China is a much bigger, much more powerful state than it was. 10 years ago, that goes without saying, of course, 15 years. And like all great powers, China will throw its weight around uh, and, 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 and cause issues for neighboring states and those even further away. That's the world we have to live in. That's Australia's dystopian future, as I describe it uh, in the book. But it's, we have to get the, the basics right. And one of the basics is, do we see China as a strategic competitor and threat as our enemy? Or do we see China uh, as a country with which we'll have strategic cooperation? Okay, and well, we haven't resolved that. Or if we have resolved it, we've resolved it in favour of the position the US has taken, which is very explicitly views China as a strategic threat. But as Angus Houston, the former head of the ADF, said two or three weeks ago on The Guardian, China is not our enemy. Now, if we could get a common understanding in Australia that that was the case, uh, we could then you know, very creatively, I think, craft policies of engagement with China. Uh, not on every issue, there'll be lots of differences, but there'll be many areas where we can do it. And one last point on this, Chris, when you ask about how China views us, when I first went to Beijing as ambassador, uh, they used to say to me in the foreign ministry, uh, Australia used to play such a constructive role in the region you created APEC, you led on the uh, Cambodian peace settlement, you did a whole lot of things, but um, uh, Australia's diplomacy doesn't seem to be there any longer. Now, 
Now China doesn't need us. Because then they said, you did things we would like to do, but we could never do. And mainly because they'd be blocked by other countries. Um, we played a very important role in generating ideas and generating you know, uh, 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 regional cooperation. And uh, uh, all that's gone. And the question is, does it need to go? Well, we haven't touched on uh, sort of DFAT, their budget, um, the defence budgets and how that might impact on diplomacy. But uh, I like the way we've finished that off. And I think given the, the hour and you've been, you've been going back to back with interviews uh, throughout the day, as you do when you're doing a book launch, so well done. Um, we'll leave it there. And again, I think hopefully we've given enough uh, to the audience that uh, this book is, is worth a read. And it's worth a read because it allows you to follow uh, sort of the, the trajectory and where things are actually moving uh, week by week and, and de almost day by day at the moment uh, on that. And uh, obviously we've got some uh, key events coming up uh, and the 70th year of the Alliance with the US next year as well. So the rhetoric uh, and that diplomatic language will continue. And it's definitely one something I look at uh, is the language that is used uh, out of the US, China, well, across the region really. <clears throat> it doesn't leave me with much faith, to be honest, and uh, but it's definitely one to watch. So look, my feedback, my constructive feedback, uh, this is a very well written book. Uh, you're, you're very well, very obviously well, well versed with China. I like the personal experiences and the anecdotes that you provided, uh, and it's a very well informed read. And it's also not from a security intelligence read, it's their economic read, which I think is important to get that. You mentioned debate. So this could well be uh, an ongoing debate and discussion. Uh, so certainly in the current context of 2020 uh, provides that immediate historical relevance uh, and also the D DFAT insights. Um, the only thing I did find was the, the technology side. Uh, we cover a lot more on technology and the tech race uh, is in quite contrast. And I think uh, if any budding authors are out there, if you're bringing a book out on that could also balance the military, the economic, but I also think uh, the technology side uh, is also worth covering off. So look, um, Jeff Raby, uh, thank you so much. The author of China's Grand Strategy and Australia's Future in the New Global Order. It's been a long day for you. And thank you very much for joining us on Life Security TV. Thank you so much for having me, Chris. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Jeff. Bye -bye. Absolute pleasure. All the best. Oh, thank you.